So what we'd like to do now is look at some memes together and have a little lighthearted discussion about how we communicate some of these things that we're trying to spread. And just just to clarify at the beginning here, why we use humor, um, or, or sometimes asked, you know, why we publish memes and satirical videos since they seem to, to be unfitting for the seriousness of the topic we're addressing. And we don't publish them simply because we like memes or wish to mock others, as some other websites do. As pastors, as missionaries, we hold ourselves to a high standard, and our reasons are biblical. And you can read some of some more about those reasons on our website if you go to sellingjesus.org and click on graphics. But uh, let me just share my screen here, and we're going to walk through some of these and talk through them. <laughs> this is my is, favorite uh, of, uh, probably all of them John, to, John is the genius behind a lot of these so I'll well, let him chime in here I was going to say I actually have to give uh, Conley credit for this one because I um, uh, it's adapted from one of his ones which was I think on uh, um, selling preaching CDs and so I just tweaked it a little bit um, but yeah I think this is my favorite because it's so like normal for today so if, if someone was yeah. to say this at a conference today like no one would blink they'd be like yeah that's completely appropriate and in fact that person is being very generous um mm -hmm. you know wow they're giving 50 percent off oh that's so nice of them um and so you know apply that to any preacher anyone today everyone's like yeah what a great guy but then you just this is what i love about the memes you just take that and you apply it to the early church and all of a sudden you realize how um, embarrassing it is. <laughs> All of a sudden, it, it's uh, it's no longer something admirable. It's actually something embarrassing. Um, yeah. And I think this one does the best job out of all of the memes of doing that, just applying what we do today straight to the early church and realizing how bad it is. All right, the next one here. Yeah, this next one on the right here. I like this one because, yeah, this is another instance of what most people would find in any Christian book today on the the front matter, this copyright restriction. It could be a book about grace. It could be a book about <laughs> generosity. It's going to start out with these very selfish sounding statements, all rights reserved, and would be a little off-putting if you weren't used to it, but we're completely used to it now. I don't know anyone that reads that first page of a book that mentions the copyright um so usually you're just so used to flicking past that okay you got the title page you got the copyright statement and you just go straight to the first page but considering mm -hmm. you know um in this case this is god's word we're talking about this is the bible and uh yeah if you actually read those first words when you open the bible um it's can it's completely contrary contrary to the message of the bible <laughs> that yeah. scripture may not be Shared, quoted, up to a certain limit, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. All right. This next one on the left here. <laughs> we haven't paid the royalties for this song yet, Paul. You got to stop them. When I was creating these, I was trying to express my frustration at why people they just couldn't see how how ridiculous these views are. Um, and when I realized, you know, I was like, what if? We did. What if the early church did this? That's where all the, pretty much most of these memes came from. So, yeah, again, just taking the the practice we do worship music at the moment and applying it to the early church. You know, <laughs> would they have paid song royalties and and the fact that they would have actually been breaking the law if they had, you know, and today if you if you use a worship song without having a license, you're actually breaking the law by worshiping God and using that song to do that. Mm -hmm. All right, so the one on the right, who serves as a soldier without charging every citizen? Who plants a vineyard and does not take a bite of every grape? Who tends a flock and does not drink milk from every animal? In the same way, those who minister should receive payment from those served. So, Conley is the expert on 1 Corinthians, yeah. so I'll let him chime in here. Yeah, I, I mean, once again, this is John's meme, but... Uh... Yeah, that's how most people take what Paul is saying. You know, what, what he says in 1 Corinthians 9 is, and, and to put this in a larger context, you know, chapter chapter 6, he says, you know, all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. So the right to sex does not mean the right to sleep with a prostitute. 
And then he also talks about food there, which he addresses later in chapters 8 and 10, where he says, use that same phrase again, all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. So the right to eat food does not mean the right to eat things sacrificed to an idol. And then chapter 9 is an illustration of chapters 8 and 10, which are about food sacrificed to idols. And a lot of people just see him as giving blanket permission to take any kind of money, no matter in what form, when the whole point is the same thing. The right to receive money does not mean the right to charge. Just like you have these other rights that are limited in nature, not plenary, uh, so it is with this. But this is how a lot of people read it. Um, if you have a right to receive, it means you have a right to receive from each individual the exact proportion that uh, that is due, uh, rather than uh, trusting God to uh, supply you through those, as, as Paul is arguing for. That's yeah, a really and- good explanation. I, I haven't actually heard you put it in those exact words before, and I... That was really helpful. Often, one objection we'll get is that people are like, well, you know, selling selling my book, selling my teaching, this is my way of being supported. So you're saying that ministry should be supported, not sold. Well, this is my way that I get supported. It can sound nice, yeah, by by paying for it, you're supporting the, the author. But, yeah, the, the big difference um, with the way, you know, proper ministry is funded, the church, the early church, is that you're not charging every single person for every single bit of ministry. You're supporting the ministry, but um, when, when you say, you know, this this way is a way of supporting me, you're actually saying, you know, every single little bit, every tiny little bit of ministry you get, you need to pay for it. <laughs> yeah. Why doesn't Jesus charge for his ministry like us? Yeah, no one is going to value it if they haven't paid anything for it. I think this is Andrew's one. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've been on that soapbox for a while, but yeah, this is the classic objection that we get. You know, actually, the recent video—I don't know if you saw any, John. The recent video on shepherds for sale. Did anyone say that in the comments? Um, Nobody would right. value her book if she didn't charge for it. Um, uh, I can't. I didn't see any. I was kind of surprised. Yeah. I, yeah. That. Seems to be the knee-jerk reaction. If you look at Christians like non-player characters as NPCs, uh, this is like their pre-scripted response in most cases to the issue of money and ministry. Uh, they all seem to have this pre-scripted response written in ingrained in them. And so we've done our best to to undermine that in other videos and articles and stuff, but we don't need to belabor that here. I was recently talking to a pastor who uh, was resonating with a lot of these ideas and talking about how how good it is to provide things freely. And he was saying that he uh, he was talking about the program that they have at the at the church to make sure that men who want to get further theological uh, education have their tuition provided for and everything. Mm-hmm. And they says, but we make them buy their books because they've got to have some skin in the game. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, there it is. <laughs> there it there is. It is. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I mean, I would hope the skin in the game would be the uh, understanding of your obligations before God and even your fellow church members. But also, I'll throw in there that if you are running some program like that where you're where you're working with another seminary or something, I'm not saying that the church has to provide people all their books or anything like that. Um, right. But that the motivation should not be the the skin in the game. Uh, exactly. Argument. Yeah. Yeah. This Go one, um, I'd probably say this. I feel like this one bites the most. Uh, for people since I made it. Um, mm-hmm. It kind of it kind of came out of, uh, I actually offered to write an article for um, TGC on um, on that verse about Jesus saying that you can't serve both God and money and the implications that has for people that make money out of ministry. Um, yeah, and it's, it's just really interesting because, you know, as a pastor, I'm always thinking, obviously I exegete the passage, but then I apply it. And I'm like, what is the best application um, the best example for serving both God and money. And I feel like you can't really get closer than trying to profit from ministry. Like surely that is the the best and clearest example of trying to serve both God and money. Yeah. And the fact that people aren't willing to discuss that, you know, name me, uh, name me an author, name me someone in ministry that has really tackled this question in regard to ministry and in regard to how people make money and get royalties from their books get royalties from their songs. You know, pastors are meant to apply scripture to themselves as well. And I haven't seen anyone apply this, um, try to wrestle with this themselves in ministry. 
Absolutely. You know, th sometimes they'll give some kind of vague answer, you know, as long as you're not doing for the money. But <laughs> you know, when you're receiving money, you know, it's, yeah, you have to wrestle a bit deeper than that. All right. So the next one, we got the early church and Paul in prison saying, I'll put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. I'll always offer it free of charge. And then we've got the most prosperous society ever. Oh, I wish I didn't have to commercialize my ministry, but unlike Paul, my finances aren't very stable right now. Yeah, so there's actually a backstory to this one. Someone pretty much replied that on the, in a Facebook comment, like pretty much exactly that. And that's why I made a meme out of it, because uh, that was their argument that, you know, unlike Paul, they don't have stable finances. I'm like, <laughs> you think, you think yeah. Paul had stable finances? Like, Paul didn't have electricity paul didn't have a flushing toilet paul didn't have, you know he got beaten and stoned and his life was not that great and and even when his life was at its peak he still didn't have smartphones in that you know all these luxuries that we enjoy now mm -hmm. um and you know i'm not obviously not trying to minimize that people have real struggles today and yes there's there's people in our society even though they have a, a car and a smartphone they're still struggling to get by i'm not trying to minimize that sure. um but taking a step back and looking at the big picture, we we are the most prosperous society ever, um, America, but also the West, um, Australia included. And so it's it's just an absurd idea that um, Paul would be better off than we are. Right, and and this completely misses the whole point when people say this. Oh, I'm short on funds, or I'm I'm living below the poverty level right now, so I have to sell my ministry. <laughs> It misses the whole point that, hello, God is waiting to bless you more than you can ask or think. Have you tried trusting him to provide for your needs right now rather than your own financial prowess thinking that, oh, because I put a price tag on this, everyone's going to come flocking to it and buy it and I'll, <laughs> I'll finally have my finances covered. I mean, that is the opposite of what usually happens. Usually you just stop doing what you you're doing because you weren't able to sell enough anyway. You just get depressed because you didn't get the blessing of seeing other people blessed by what you did because nobody bought it. That's sad. <laughs> and then you end up poorer than you would have been if you had trusted God to provide. The one on the left here, um, church history class 2024, and then 100 years in the future on the bottom. There's kind of personal backstories to most of these memes and say, so, you know, I was I remembering being in church history class and hearing about the Crusades and all those things. And you yeah. know, fair enough, even myself at some points are wondering, like, you know, were there any genuine Christians back then during these times were there, when all these crazy things were happening in the church? I'm willing to bet that uh, it'll be the case in the future when things eventually change. They have to because, you know, God's mm -hmm. at work and people will look back and People are hoping they're going to look back at them and think what a great yeah, minister they were, like what a great job they did sharing the gospel. But a lot of people are going to look back at this time and just wonder how on earth um, yeah, Christians put up with the sale of ministry. <laughs> yeah. I was listening to Gary Thomas talk about how quickly you can fade into insignificance as um, a very, very gifted minister of the gospel or whatever. And he he was talking about this guy, this author, he was his favorite author of all time. He just can't believe it that this guy is not even that old. He's he wrote in the nineteen hundreds, but now you can only get his books as used copies if you're lucky to find any. He just can't believe it. And so many people now don't even know who the guy is, but it's his favorite favorite Christian author. Just makes you think, you know, like if you really want to leave a lasting legacy for future generations to look back and say, wow, um, this person made an impact and continues to make an impact, well, the best way to do that is to free up your resources. And uh, unfortunately, like most authors, even though he was famous in his day, maybe, or very influential in his day, his books were locked down and they're kind of orphan works now and they're still under copyright. And so... They're not able to be reprinted or circulated digitally and all of that kind of thing. And so it's something to keep in mind. Are you wanting your ministry to have that legacy impact? So next one. I made, I made this one for you, Andrew, because I know Thank how much you. you love that verse. Uh, it, it warmed <laughs> into my heart. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so we, we all have heard this a million times. Um, 
this definitely did get mentioned as it's is this is another one of the npc automated scripts that people have as christians who who walk around mindlessly parroting this comeback to what we're trying to advocate and it is you shall not muzzle an ox and so it feels like this is an idol of some kind because people defer to it or put it up on a pedestal so often as the only thing that they need to really understand money and ministry and that they think that it means that it gives you the right to commercialize everything in uh, Jesus name. So, um, yeah. so I, I think charitably, a lot of people assume that the, the economy that exists around ministry is like the only one that could exist. Right. And so yeah. if, okay, mm. okay. Books, the way that you get money is by selling the book, right? This isn't how it worked for, you know, many years. It wasn't until copyright came around in the 1700s that people started getting royalties on books as opposed mm. to being supported by patrons. Um, but a lot of people assume that. And so then when you say people shouldn't be selling these things, they assume you mean they shouldn't be making any money at all. And even if you try to say something else, a lot of times it'll go in through one ear and out the other because right. what you're describing is a different model than the one that you're used to seeing. And so they they think that the, this is the main way someone would get money. This is mm-hmm. the, and, and so if you're saying it's not that, then you're trying to to legitimize the whole project, which is not really what we're trying to do. Um, we yeah. think that authors should still be supported, um, you know, uh, authors, Christian teachers, but not, uh, yeah, just not through sales. Yeah, and it is genuinely difficult for us to understand why, when we say ministry should be supported. So the first thing that we say in, in our our phrase that comes from the Dorian principle, ministry should be supported, not sold. But people only hear the not sold, and then they assume all of these these wrong things and don't even listen to the first part, which is it should be supported. They assume that the only way it should be supported or could be supported is by selling it. And this is their go-to verse to to make sure they they let us know that they know the Bible better than we do. Okay, so moving on. Classic uh, biblical counseling. Yes. And uh, this is just a great ironic thing, and I've already talked a lot, so I don't know if you guys want to jump in here, um, but this well, is also one of my, th- this is one of my <laughs> my pet peeves or soapboxes for sure, because biblical counseling is something that is needed, beautiful, wonderful, uh, a gift from God to the church that we can counsel one another with truth and life. When we turn it into this money making sort of scheme it's just so ironic to be giving people this advice especially when people are stressed about money and then charging them exorbitant prices all right so we've talked a lot about books here's just another another one on the right Um, yeah and i i think this meme is good at bringing out you know this isn't what people most people want like we um we agree that most people you know they they want to share about god they want to um help people grow in faith and we know that they don't really want to be locking things down. They wish they didn't have to, um, but they just don't see any other way because everyone's telling them that you know this is the only way to get funded. This is what you should be doing. Um, you need to go with a big publisher or you won't get seen. And um, yeah, you know, there's there's ups and downs, but ultimately we need to be faithful to scripture. Um, but yeah, I think this meme is good at bringing out that you know you you don't want to be doing this <laughs> when you, you deep down inside your heart. Yeah, and the, the reason, you know, the devil is screaming so loud is because that really represents the way the world is just so vocal about this. You have to be doing this. I mean, it's just you're an idiot if you're not making your passion your passive income. Okay. I'll let uh, John or Conley take this next one. I'll just briefly say these two are just trying to help people realize what they're actually saying. So when they say, you know, the worker deserves their wages, don't muzzle the ox, um, they don't think very deeply when they say that. And so these two are just trying to bring out, you know, what are you actually saying when you're saying that? Um, You're saying that 
you know, Paul's permitting any former ministry to be commercialized as much as you like. And when you press people, you know, most people will say, no, that's not what I meant. But then they don't really think, you know, okay, so what does it mean then? <laughs> so. Yeah, I really like this one, John. You did a great job with the all rights reserved. It it really captures what the subtext is when you're reading the copyright page on all of these Christian books. It does not give you the idea of a selfless, generous mindset. Yeah, and those are the two views people have. Often, you know, there'll be some people that actually understand what it means, but most people will just be the the first one, the ignorance. They just add it because it seems like it makes the work sound better or sound more proper. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and in terms of this last meme, basically, I, I was pointing out, I've been I'm pointing out to a number of people that you know, if if ministry wasn't sold, um, it'd be really easy to identify <laughs> who the false teachers are. Um, because they'd be the ones after the money. Uh, it's not easy to identify them because everyone's doing the same thing. The the um, good, yep. theological, theologically accurate and rich uh, authors are doing just the same as as the false teachers. They're all selling their books. And you right. know, we're, this is more talking about um, ebooks here. So we're talking about ebooks because you know there's no reason why you should charge for an ebook. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, paying for printing is another matter we can talk about later, but. Um, you know, if you are searching for an ebook, it should be easy to identify who is the false teacher and who isn't by the ones who's charging for it. Yeah, and just to be clear, this is not reality. What you're looking at, this is what we we hope would be reality someday. Um, Hunger for God and Keller's book and and Tripp's book there are definitely not going to be free when you go to Amazon. <laughs> um, I think often they, they cost more than yeah. the false teachers sometimes. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. 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 So there's this question of what, how did the early church uh, discern false teachers? Uh, you do see in Paul's writings that uh, that he identifies false teachers as those who think that godliness is a means of gain. And in one particular chapter in the Dorian Principle, I collect a bunch of verses where uh, he talks about that. And you see that this is uh, a litmus test that's that's to be used. And you see that with other things in Scripture, uh, other litmus tests, for example. Uh, John talks about the one who has the son, has the father, but there's some difficulty in applying that. You realize you have to ask, like, what son does he have? You know, what Jesus does he have? It's not just, oh, he says he loves Jesus. So uh, these litmus tests aren't all easy litmus tests, but they but they exist in Scripture. And this is supposed to be one of them. So later on in the church, uh, after the apostles, after the, the Bible is written and the apostles are dead, uh, we have early church sources. Uh, that show us that this is what they were doing. They were testing these things out. Uh, the Shepherd of Hermas talks about false teachers being those who charge for prophecy. Uh, there's some other resources. Uh, the Didache, which is written during the first century, even during when some of these apostles are alive, uh, talks about someone who comes and uh, stays for three nights, taking the hospitality of the people that you're to consider him a false teacher and send him on his way. I collect some uh, some quotes about that in the uh, in the book as well. There are examples that we have in the early church to show that this is what they were using as one of the big signs that someone's a false teacher. And later on, when the when many begin engaging in simony, you know, the the sale of ordinations, this is what people would ask too. They would try to figure out, did this person engage in the selling or buying of ordinations? And that would determine whether or not they were a false teacher. Thanks for that. So I think what we'll do is wrap it up here. Thanks guys for having some fun chatting through these. Hope some of you who are watching enjoyed it as well. We'll catch you in the next video.